Good morning, church. We are grateful to be with you in the house of the Lord this morning. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Can we just turn our eyes to heaven today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you are doing in this day and in this season. We ask for you to pour out your spirit over this house today and have your way. We thank you that joy comes in the morning. And we lift our eyes to heaven and we say, good morning, Lord. Let your joy be our strength today. Let your joy continue to be our strength today. Carry us through. Do what only you can do, Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise.
morning, River City Church. How you guys doing? Anyone got the joy of the Lord this morning? All right, I'm going to ask that one more time. Anyone got some joy of the Lord this morning? There we go. Children, you may be dismissed. Uh, to my right, your left, you'll see Pastor Shauna and Nancy Brick back there. Get ready for your fun-filled, action-packed adventure time in Kids Church. Uh, also, if you are, if this is your first time with us, please pull this card out in front of you, in the chair back in front of you. Go ahead and scan that and um, uh, fill out the information. We'd love to grab a cup of coffee with you. If you have any questions about our church, that's a way to get connected. Also, in May, I, I hope this is on your radar. If not, I, it, it should be on your radar from here forward. May 6th and 7th, we have our Revive Conference at our Galt campus. So it's going to be um, Saturday at 1, uh, 1.30, and then we have baptisms, and we have men's and women's breakouts, children and youth breakouts. It's going to be awesome. We have all kinds of incredible speakers coming to that. So um, go ahead and scan that for more info and to sign up. You're not going to want to miss that. This is going to be really cool because it's both of our campuses coming together uh, for, a combined, for a combined conference and really just uh, going deeper in the Lord. So uh, with that being said, we have our Tuesday studies as well in our office area. Um, we are going through um, the Red Letter Challenge. But let's just... Uh, Oh, also, uh, tithes and offerings, we, do, we don't pass plates um, like a lot of churches do. We, we have our giving center in the lobby. Um, all that's out there. So go ahead and take care of that. But be, ugh, I'm so tongue-tied this morning. <sighs> Coffee's starting to wear off. I'm going to I'm gonna have to run to Dutch Bros real quick. I'm just kidding. Let's just pray. Father, right now, Lord, we thank you for your joy that is our strength. And for those of us in this place that need a little extra dose of your strength this morning, for those who need a little extra encouragement this morning, Father, will you come and pour out your spirit on us in a new and greater way? Lord, I, I thank you that we don't come here and play church. But Lord, we come here to encounter the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, we come here to encounter the life-changing presence of God. And so this morning, Lord, I ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit like never before. Lord, I ask that every son and daughter in this place would hear from you clearly. Lord, that, that any lies that they, have, that, that they have believed will be broken in Jesus' name and they will be replaced with the truth of your word. Lord, come and do a mighty work this morning. Lord, we're praying for signs, wonders, and miracles, God. We love you so much. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. two or more are gathered in his name he is there church he is here yes. and you know one of my favorite moments one of my favorite things to do in life is to just be at home alone sit at my piano and just worship quietly and I shared it before and I'll share it again I'm a mother of six and so to have quiet time with the Lord it's a very valuable thing. It's one of my favorite things in the world. To just sit alone with the Lord. But I'll tell you what, there's something in my spirit that stirs up and gets so excited before every Sunday morning, before we step into this time of corporate worship together. Because I know that where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. And I know that he is true to his word. And I know that he is faithful. 
And I know that he is moving and doing something in his church today. And I am grateful to be part of that. You see, there's something that happens when the church comes together. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we come together and we worship God in spirit and in truth. There's a lot going on in the world. And I understand that we may not all be like-minded on every topic in the world today. But when we come into the house of the Lord and into his presence, we set it all aside and we say, Lord, we are unified and we are here for your presence. There is no greater thing we can rally together for than his presence. The word also says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Can we lift our hands together this morning? Just invite the Holy Spirit into this place with your own mouth, with your own words. Can we just pray out loud? Holy Spirit, come. We are ready for you to move again. fresh wave of your presence Lord come and move again in Jesus name we're gathered in Jesus name in your name and for your glory Lord in Jesus name This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. Let's sing that again together. This is this is a house of worship this is a place of praise where every demon trembles where we proclaim your name and this is a house of healing let's sing that this is a house of healing Hearts are full of faith, Lord. You have our full attention. You have the final say. Who we say, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is.
to the dry bones and say, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. There's a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet Jesus. Everything in your name, Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We say, come alive, Jesus' name. Come alive, he overcame the grave. Resurrection power. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of me. We bring everything to the feet, everything. This is a house of miracles. I feel led to just speak the name of Jesus over your mind. And so I speak the name of Jesus over your mind right now. I think this is for someone, maybe a few of you in this room, but I really feel led to just call out those who have been in a real sticky place mentally. And it's not, it's not to the point where you've been diagnosed with depression or you struggle with anxiety, but there's been something that's been happening in your mind just over the past couple of years where you're in a real sticky place mentally. And you are so desperate to feel that joy again. And so I speak the name of Jesus over you right now. This is a house of miracles because his presence is here today. And so Father, I ask for you to come. And Lord, do what only you can do. Restore. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. You make all things new again. You're a redeemer of all things. Even time. So you can know today that no time has been lost or wasted. because he's a redeemer of all things. And I believe this is a word for someone in the house today. So please receive it if it is for you. And we say, come alive in the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working all things for good. I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe you're working all things for good. Oh, one more time. I 
God, we thank you. This is a house of miracles today. God, you want to work in our life. We thank you, God, that we don't serve a God who is dead, that God is in that grave, but we serve a God who is alive and well and working in our lives, bringing healing, bringing salvation, bringing provision. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise this morning. God is good. Amen. God is good, and you can be seated this morning. It is great to see you here, and um, what a great Easter we had, and I'm excited about what God's going to do in our life as we move out of that Easter season, and you can turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 today. We do have, I believe um, Pastor Jamie mentioned it to you, our Revive Conference coming up May 6th and 7th. May 6th will be um, in Galt. We're going to have breakouts, and we have a lot of fun stuff happening. One of the things we're going to do is baptism service, Okay. So if you're here today and you have not been baptized, we would love to get you baptized. Baptized is an outward proclamation of an inward transformation. So if you're looking at your life, you said, man, God has transformed me in this last year, want to get baptized, please get online, register for that. We would love to baptize you. We're going to do it on Saturday, May 6th on the Galt campus at 3.30. So it's going to be a great time of celebration. So I'm starting a series today. The name of the series is de-stress your life. Anyone here deal with a little bit of stress in your life? Anyone? A few of you. Come on, let's be honest. I'm going to be very honest with you. How many of you here deal with stress in your, in your life? So I feel like, um, I really feel like this is an important series. I've been sitting on it for a while, and I felt like after Easter, the Lord, he pulled the trigger on it, said, hey, I want you to bring this, this series. I believe it's going to be really important for some of you here. You've gotten an outline. It's going to be an interactive message, an interactive outline. Grab that. If you don't have it, you can go back there. They'll get you one, and I want you to interact with me and really dig into the message. Message. Stress is a big problem today. Stress is a huge problem in our world. It's a huge problem in our, in our country. As a matter of fact, here's statistics on it. 100% deal with some level of stress. Everybody deals with some level of stress in your life. How could you not? So we're going to start from the honest place. I deal with stress. You deal with stress. The next statistic is this. 75% would classify stress as moderate. So it's something you deal with pretty constantly in your life, and, and it's something that's even maybe a little bit changing the way you live your life, and it's affecting your marriage, it's affecting your kids, it's affecting things for you. It's not just stress here and there, it's affecting things for your, for your life. The, the third stat here, 48% of people lose sleep due to stress. 48%. Anyone here, okay, I'll be the first. Anyone here ever lost sleep because of stress in your life, okay? Um, if, if I were to fit in any category and I asked you on your outline, what, where would you fit? This would be where I would circle right here because there are times that stress can get to the point in my life where I will lose sleep. 33% live with debilitating stress in their life. Like it's constantly stressed. They're constantly stressed out. You know somebody, not you, somebody else that's like that, right? Like, they're, like this is what I would describe it as. They live at a nine and one little thing and they're over the 10. Like they explode. Like you walk around them like, oh man, I hope I don't do anything. Some of you have a boss that way, not Jamie or Stora, but other people <laughs> have a boss that way, right? You walk around, you're like one little thing. They're living with debilitating stress in, the, in their life and anything sets them over. Like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll claim that category right there. There are seasons in my life and that's really what I'm gonna be digging in to this next three weeks that I will lose sleep over stress, that stress does, does affect me. And there's a lot of things that can attribute it to our, to our stress, right? Kids, spouse sitting next to you right now, kids, <laughs> finances, kids, right? Like, uh, right? It just keeps, it, all these things, but I tell you what, you don't know stress until you have, have kids. Like kids will bring a high level of stress to your life. And I hear that it doesn't get any easier when they grow up. I'm, I'm thinking it does, but, but I hear, and then you get grandkids, you gotta stress about grandkids. Um, you, then there's all the things that go wrong in your life. I mean, every day things can go wrong. Your car break down, your battery go dead, your alternator go dead, you get a flat tire, you go home, you push the garage door opener, it breaks on its way up, anyone have that happen? Like, that's a bad day, HVAC goes out on your house. Like, these things happen, and it brings up our, and if you're living at nine, if you're living right here, Boy, those stuff, that stuff is not good, is it? It puts you right over. Then you've got things around us. You've got, um, you've got politics. 
all the threats of war around you. You've got pandemics that hit, then you've got, you've got the economy. So these things all bring a lot of stress. And then they add tax day to it next week. I, tax day, is, if you don't know it, tax day, I think is Tuesday, right? Tuesday of this week, it's coming up. So we're just not going to do our taxes this year. It's too stressful. So um, we're just not, we're going to skip that. I'm just kidding. But um, I mean, stress is a, is a big deal and it comes from all directions in our life. The, the question is, isn't, do you deal with stress? But the question is, how do you deal with stress? How are you going to deal with that stress that comes upon your life? Because some of you, the stress is wrecking your marriage. Let's be honest. Some of you, your stress level is wrecking your relationships with your kids. It's wrecking your relationship with other people. Your stress level is affecting your life. So it's not about do you deal with stress. It is how do you deal with that stress? What are the tools that you can have to deal with that stress in your life? in your life. Some of you are business owners. That brings a lot of stress. You've got jobs that are very important. That brings a lot of stress. You've got families going every direction. It brings a lot of stress. How do I deal with that stress? I, I'm going to talk to you in the next three weeks about the big three things in my life that bring stress. And I think that it'll probably be the same for you. The three big things, if I'm going to be up at night because of stress, there's one mainly that I'll talk to you about, but, but there's three things that, that cause me stress. Money, time, and relationships. Almost all of my stress, it's around one of those three things. Anyone else should say that's, that's true. We're going to be a little interactive. You say that's true. It's one of those, like those things bring me, bring me stress. So, so those things that are the main three things that bring me stress, money, time, and relationships. And so I want to try to give you some tools for this. And I'm going to get so practical with this that I actually had to sit. I've never done this before. I had to sit down with my wife. I had to take her through this today to make sure it was okay to share what I'm sharing with you. That's how, how practical I'm going to get as I talk to you about number one, which is money. Money stress. Money stress is a big deal. So here's, I want to give you, it's on your outline. This is our, this is our strategy for dealing with stress that we're going to employ in the next three weeks. It comes out of Philippians 4, 6. It says, do not be anxious about anything. Thank you, Paul. How many of you would say, that's easy. You got that, Paul. Like, what, what, a, what a thing to say. Like, you can do that, Paul. Be anxious about, about nothing. I'm not going to be anxious about anything. This is where we're going to spend most of our time because there are some tools that you can, you can get that will help you to be anxious about nothing. There's actually some things that we do in our lives that aren't that smart that really make this a big problem. Okay, so we're going to spend a bulk of our time looking at the Bible and what things we can do to not have that stress and that anxiety in our life. Then it says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. So what's the next thing? Pray. Okay, so we're going to talk about some tools and then we're going to pray for you if you're dealing with stress. So we're going to, we're going to talk about it, then we're going to pray, and then we're going to believe for this, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So then we're going to pray, we're going to pray for you and we're going to pray that there's peace upon your life. How many would like a little peace in your life? Okay, we're going to pray for peace to be upon your life. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing the next, the next three weeks. So let's, let's get started talking about, about money. I read a statistic this week that 76% of people are stressed about money. I would say that it's more like 99 or 100% of people are stressed about money right now. Why? One word, inflation. How many of you know eggs used to cost like a dollar something and they're four something now? Try to go buy milk. Put gas in your car. But you cannot escape this thing called inflation. I have not talked to anybody about money that is not stressed in eight months. We're all stressed about, about money. It is the number one cause of stress statistically in the United States. It is the number two cause of divorce in the United States. How many here have ever been in a fight with your spouse about money? I would say, how, how many this week have been in a fight with your spouse about money? It is a major strain on, on marriages. And, and so we're going to really dig into this money thing. This is the thing about money. You can have a little money and be stressed about money, and you can have a lot of money and be stressed about money. As a matter of fact, if you're over in this category here today and you're like, I don't have enough money. If I had more money, I wouldn't be stressed about money. You are wrong, okay? Nothing will get you more stressed than more money, 
The more money you have, the more stress you will have in your life. So the answer, just get past that right now. The answer for you isn't to just have more money. The answer is, is actually this. It doesn't matter how much money you have today or how much money stress you have for what reasons. It's how you view and how you use money. That's what the issue is. How do you view money and how do you use money? That's what will bring you or will not bring you stress. The, the biggest cause of stress for me, and I'm being really honest with you, is money. I, I don't love money. I actually don't like money that much. I, I'd rather that we didn't have to deal with it at all. Um, I, if I'm honest with you, I don't even know how much I make. My wife deals with all the money. I'm not really money driven. I, but man, I tell you what, if money isn't there, nothing will stress me out personally when there's not money or as a leader of this church when we have money issues. Like it, it, it keeps me up at night. So I'm 45 years old now. So what's happened is I've learned some tools to help me with my money stress. So the money stress still comes and goes, but now I feel like I have some tools to deal with that money stress. And that's what I wanna give you today. I wanna give you those tools that I use to help with money. But before we do that, some basics on money. It's on your outline. Money is a very spiritual topic. You might be sitting here today, money in church. I could have gone to a money conference and gotten this. I could have listened to a podcast. It's not a, it's not a good topic for church. Money is a very spiritual topic. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know it or not, but, but um, there's 400 verses on prayer. There's just under 400 verses on faith. There are 2,000 verses on money and possessions. 15% of all that Jesus says is about money and it's about possessions. It's a huge part of the Bible. Why? Because it is a very spiritual matter. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says that. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or in the other words, where your heart is, your treasure will be. There's a connection to the deepest level of who we are with our possessions and our heart. You've heard the saying, um, if you want to know somebody's heart, look at their checkbook. It, it'll show you where you put your money shows you the direction of your heart. We don't have checkbooks anymore. Anyone carry a checkbook? Like, no, you look at your ATM. So, so you look at your, you carry a checkbook, Tawny? We're going to take up an offering. If you could get the plate, come right on over here, okay? <laughs> right? Um, if you looked at somebody's like ATM or their app on their phone, you can see where their heart is. There is a spiritual connection and Jesus knew it. That's why so much of what he talked about is about money. There's a spiritual, it's a spiritual topic. The next thing you'll see here is money is a very personal topic. That's why we get uncomfortable when we talk about it because it's a very personal thing. Your money is a very, very personal topic to you. My son, who's 10 years old, has suddenly decided it's a good idea to ask people how much they make. Um, it's, been, it's made some uncomfortable moments. So he'll see your car. I'm sorry if he does it to you today, okay? He'll see your car, and he'll be like, wow, that's a nice car. How much money do you make? And I'll be like, no, don't do that. You can't do that. It is a very personal topic. Why? Why? Because in our country, your money and your identity are tied together. Is that healthy or not? Probably not, but it's the truth. Like you start to think how you're valued by your money. You don't believe me. T tomorrow, your boss calls you into his office and says, I'm giving you a $100,000 bonus. You will walk away. You'll say, I am the man. I am the greatest guy in the world, man. I am such a hard worker. Like your identity. And then the next day, you hear your coworker got a $150,000 bonus. You're going to say, why am I such a loser? Right? Because your identity is tied to your, in the hierarchical system that we live in, it's tied to your money. The world is actually better about talking to money, about money than we are because we know this. We know where identity should be found. Where should your identity be found? It should be found in who you are in Christ, amen? That's your identity, not how much you make. But it makes it a very personal topic when we talk about it. Third thing, this is the good news. Money is a very actionable topic. There's a lot of things in your life that might be hard to deal with. Okay, maybe you've smoked for 30 years and you're like, I've got to stop smoking and it's going to be hard. It's going to be a battle. It's going to take a lot of time. You might like struggle doing or, or maybe you've got marriage problems and it's going to take a long time and there's a lot of damage. The nice thing about money is you could go home today and make some little changes in your life that will make a big difference over time. 
Matter of fact, today, you could get on that little outline I gave you, and you could make some difference changes today in your, the way you look at money that could make a big difference in your life over, over time. So it's a very actionable topic, all right? So let's get into the practice here. What I'm going to do, and I've titled it here, My Financial Priorities That Bring Me Peace. My financial priorities, I'm going to get very, very personal, that bring me peace. Now, if you look at your outline, there's mine there. I put some blanks next to it because yours might look a little different, and that's okay. But these are my financial priorities that bring me peace. This is not my budget. This is priorities that, that then create your budget. These are the priorities in my life. If I have these in place, I have peace. If I do not have these in place, I'm up at night stressed about money, okay? The first thing here is tithe. I tithe. I've tithed since I was a kid. I give 10% of everything. We actually do more than tithe. We give more. We want to be generous with our money to the kingdom of God. You might be shocked by that because some people think as a pastor, you wouldn't tithe because you give your time to the church and you get your paycheck from the church. Why would you tithe? I don't tithe because I have to. I tithe because the word of God tells me to and I want to walk in obedience. I, I could justify reasons not to tithe, or I can just be obedient to the word of God. So why is it? It doesn't make sense. Give money away and then I'll have financial peace. That doesn't make sense. Because your money is not an earthly thing. It's also a spiritual thing. It's a heavenly thing. There's that tie. There's a spiritual connection. So, so when I tithe, what does it do? Why does it give me peace? Because it puts money in its proper place. When I tithe, I'm putting my money in its proper place. I don't know if you know it, but your money is fighting for number one in your life. It's fighting for first place. It will dominate. Money will dominate your life. The Bible calls it the spirit of mammon. Mammon is a spirit that attaches itself to money and tries to pull you towards it. It tries to pull you away from things that are of real value. So I have to put money, when I tithe, I'm putting my money in its proper place. Look at what it says in, in Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops or your income. It says to honor God with the first, the first of your fruits. When you do that, when I, when, I, when I do that, when I give my tithe, this is literally what I'm doing. I'm saying money, you do not have first place in my life. Money, you're not the priority in my life. Money, you are far second to God in my life. I am making my first choice with my money. I'm not letting my money control me. I'm controlling my money. If I don't do this, I don't have financial peace. The other thing is it's a statement of, of trust. Look at the next verse, verse 10 after Proverbs 3, 9. It, sa it says this, then your barns will be abundantly filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. So when I do that, when I give my first, then what's gonna happen? I'm gonna have more than enough. So when I give, do what I'm doing? I'm saying, I trust you, God, with my money. I trust that this promise is true and will be true in my life. See, anyone that knows me knows I work really, really hard, okay? I work hard. A lot of you sitting here today, you work really, really hard for your money. You put a lot of time and a lot of effort into making money. When I tithe, I'm saying this. I'm saying, okay, God, I work hard, but I don't trust me. I trust you with my money. I trust you. The third thing is this. I invest in the kingdom. So I'm like an amateur stock guy, okay? I like doing stocks. I like buying stocks. I'll invest some stocks. So I'm an amateur stock guy. And um, so don't take financial advice from me on this, okay? <laughs> don't, take, don't take stock advice. You'll lose all your money. I'm just kidding. So what I do, though, when I look at a stock, I look at how much is it made over time and what are the dividends that it pays, okay? So is this a good purchase? Will this do good for me over time? Does it pay out dividends for, for my retirement one day? Do you know what? The kingdom of God is a great investment, it pays out great dividends. <laughs> it has for thousands and thousands of years. The church of Jesus Christ, listen, we might look at it and say, oh, I don't know if it's gonna survive. I believe me, it will survive. Do you know why? It's got a promise and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I tell you what, that's enough for me. This is a good investment. When I give to the kingdom, when I give my tithe to the church, I'm taking out of the earthly realm and I'm investing it in the spiritual realm. The only way you can invest in the spiritual realm is to invest in souls. So when I give, I'm saying, you know what? I prioritize and I believe in the kingdom of God. Okay, now we're gonna get more practical. The second thing here is this, my housing. My house, I told you, we're gonna get really practical. My house is really, really important to me personally. It's very important to me. Let me tell you why. I never thought I'd own a home, never. I'm speaking to someone here today that thinks that. I never thought I'd own a home. I made so little money 
out, out of Bible school. There was, I hardly made my rent. I could not get ahead. There was no way I was going to own a home. When I moved to Sacramento, I thought, there's no way I'll own a home. So we rented an apartment. We thought we'd, we could hardly make it in the apartment. 2010, um, or 2000, yeah, about 2010. I'm sitting in my office, and I'm making so much. I, I could have worked anywhere and made more money. I'm sitting in my office, and I felt the Lord say, me, say to me, go buy a house. And I thought, no, the Lord wouldn't tell me that. That would be a stupid thing to do. And I felt again, the Lord tell me, go buy a house. It's time for you to buy a house. So I got a real estate agent, looked around. They took us to some houses, and I felt the Lord say to me, I'm going to give you a house for 185, 185000 Don't you wish <laughs> that you could buy a house for 185000 today. Like, we buy five of them, right? <laughs> but I mean, that's 185000 So we went around. I found, we found this house. It worked good for us, and it was 235000 It was bank-owned because remember what just happened in 2008, the market? So it was, it was, it was bank-owned. And um, I told the realtor, like, okay, I want to make a $185,000 offer on it because that's what the Lord told me. <laughs> and she said, no, no, no. The bank will never do that. They would never, it'll be an insult. They won't even look at your, all, all, your offer. We need to put $200,000 offer on it. I said, oh, okay, you can put a $200,000 offer on it. I said this to my real estate agent. I promise you it's the truth. I said, but God's gonna give it to us for 185. She said, eh, okay, she wasn't a believer. <laughs> so I get a call the next day and she's crying. And she says, I don't know what kind of God you serve. I've done real estate for 20 years. I've never had this happen. I said, what? She said, the bank counter offered at 185. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Come on, listen, this is from the, I want you to hear me today. This is from the Lord. I don't want a house I've done. I want a house that he gave me. This is of the Lord. My house is a gift from, I take a lot of pride in my house. I really do. We've, we've moved one time since, and that's another miracle story. We moved one time since, and um, I love my house. I mow my lawn, and I'm like, oh, yes, this lawn looks awesome. Do you know why? I never thought I would own a house. The other day, we had a little bit of a fence go down, one section. I said, yes, I get to fix my fence. I took it all down. I put it back up. I sat back, and I said, I put that fence up on my house with cash. I'm awesome. I'm a great fence builder, <laughs> right? I love my, I take pride in my house. Why? Because it's a gift, friends. What you have is a gift from God. And if you don't have it yet, you do the right things and God will give you that gift. He will give you the security that you need. Now, now I put here, my goal is 35% of my income because I don't want to be house poor. So this is what people do. You get your first house, you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to get another house. I'm making a little more. I'm going to get another house. I'm going to get another house. Upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Before you know it, you have, you, your house payment's so huge, you, you're sitting in that beautiful house and can't afford food, right? This is what happened in 2008. This is what happened to people. So we don't, we don't, we are in the house we need. We don't upgrade. Now you say, well, I can't get to 35%. We weren't at first either, but you know what? When we weren't at 35%, I didn't have peace, but then as our income went up, we stayed in the same house. And guess what? Before we knew it, we were at 35%. And guess what I have in my life? I've got peace because we've got it in balance. The next thing, I want to have stability for my family. You know what's cool about my house payment? If you guys all got together after church today and you said, okay, we hate this pastor. That sermon was horrible. He is gone. Guess what I could still do? Make my house payment. <laughs> you and I could go to work for Uber and I could make my house payment because it brings stability to my family when I keep my, set, my house payment low. It gives me peace. I told you I'm going to get real personal. It gives me peace. The next thing is, is savings. Uh, listen, listen to this verse, okay? This is a scriptural thing. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise store up choice food in olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. We went to Starbucks the other day at lunchtime, me and my wife, and she drank her Starbucks in like 45 minutes. I drink my Starbucks from lunch all the way to dinner because if I'm paying that much for a Starbucks, I'm drinking it very slowly, <laughs> very slowly. I said, that made me mad. You just sucked that thing down. She goes, I need the caffeine. I'm like, well, that's a lot of money for caffeine, right? I, I'm telling you, I, this is how we got to look at our money. Sometimes we just, some of us, we get everything. It goes up. We use more. We spend it. We blow it. It's not a scriptural thing. Do you know what you need in your life? You need savings. Do you know why? Because if you don't have it, you're going to be stressed at night. How many of you here, when you were first married, you got a flat tire in your car and it was an emergency, a financial emergency, 
that you got a flat tire. Oh, I remember. You got a flat tire. I thought that it was the end of the world. When my wife said, hey, we're out of toilet paper, I said, no, we can't afford toilet paper. But guess what I have now? I have some savings. And if I get a flat tire on my way to work or my way home today, I can go, eh, I'll get a new tire. It's not an emergency anymore. Savings takes the stress out of your life. Please hear me. You might say, I don't have any right now. Start building your savings. It will take stress out of your life, and it is scriptural. It gives you margin. Now, this is the thing. Some of you are sitting here today, and you're like, I have no margin in my life. I want you, I'm going to be real honest. I said I was, neither do I right now because of that word we've just talked about, inflation. It killed my margin in my life. You don't have to amen me on that if it did to you either, okay? Let's well, all be honest. I haven't talked to anybody that's not in that position. It killed my margin. But I'm going to keep doing what is right anyway, and I'm going to keep pushing forward, and I'll get it back. I'll get back to that spot, okay? The next thing here, retirement. Number four, retirement. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest, what, why, I, why did I put retirement? Because I can't sleep at night if I'm not putting retirement away. Let me tell you why. As a pastor, I am self-employed. That means I have no pension and no 501K. Is that what you call that? 501K. I don't have that. Never have. 401K? Okay. I've never had that. Okay? I don't have that. I don't have those things happening for me. So do what I need to do for myself. Man, it's easy not to sometimes. But I, I love you too much not to put money into retirement. Let me tell you why. Some pastors, they've got great churches like I have right now, and they get older and older, and they haven't put any money away, and it's time for them to retire, and they can't retire, and guess what ends up happening? God releases them from the church, and they can't go because they need a paycheck, and they stay, and they stay, and they stay, and you know what happens? These people leave, these people leave, these people leave, these people leave because there's no ministry happening. Before you know it, you've got you and four and no more in the church that you built, and you kill your church. I love you too much to not put money into retirement. So every month, I put money into retirement. If I don't, I am stressed out. Do you know why? I have a dream. Do you know what my dream is? Not to starve when I'm an old person. (laughs) Come on. I have a dream a little bit bigger than that too. I have a dream that when I go out with my four kids and their spouses and their kids one day, and we go to a nice Mexican restaurant, and we're having tacos, and we're enjoying the day, that I can say, I got that bill. Don't worry, kids. I'm, I'm serious. I have a dream that I can do that one day. So you know what I'm going to do? You know what else? I have another dream. I have a dream that when I'm, when I'm older, I'm senior and I'm retired, that, that will be my mo- the most generous years of my life. That's my, my dream is this. When I see a pastor and he's new and he's struggling, I can say, hey, I've got your rent this month. Don't worry about it. I can say, see that missionary over there? I'm going to go and I'm going to help him on the field this month. I have a dream that my last years will be my most generous years. So do you know what I do? Man, if I'm not doing this, I'm up at night. I'm stressed, okay? Now I'm going to give you a little relief because number five here, as little debt as possible. Some would say right now, that should say no debt. That would be great, but I don't want to lay that on you today. And I don't want to be a hypocrite because do you know what? Sometimes I have a little debt. And it keeps me up at night. And I go like this, and then I bring it down. And I go like this, and I bring it down. And my, my wife's car, I know I'm up against this right now, okay? My wife's car has 198,000 miles on it. And it will not stop. Anyone have one of those cars? I want that thing to break. It looks like a piece of garbage. I want it to break, but it just won't break. So I just can't get a new car. So we're driving that thing and driving it and driving it. In the next couple of years, that car will break. And guess what I'm going to have to do? Oh, my poor wife. <laughs> I have to buy her a new car. And I know that I will have some, what? I'll have some debt. Now, you might say, well, no, 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 you, you don't have to have that debt. You start making your car payment now, and by the time you need it, you'll have a new car. If you can do that, good for you. I can't do that. I like stuff too much <laughs> to do that, right? I don't have the discipline to do that, so I will have a car payment. But listen to what the scripture says. The rich, rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. What is the borrower? Slave to the lender. So do you what I know I'm going to do? I'm going to have to make a conscious choice. But I know what choice I'm making. And I'm going to make sure I make the smartest choice possible when I buy that new car. Because I'm going to be intelligent about it. And I'm not going to make it so much that I can't sleep at night. Okay, now I'm going to give you the best one. Okay, the best point. Worship team, you can come on up. The best one on here. Number six, have fun. 
Come on, can I hear an amen on that one? Have some fun. Listen, if you're going on vacation, David, you don't need to be like, hey, pastor, I'm going on vacation. Um, Yeah, I saved up the money and we really need it. No, go on vacation with your family and have fun. Like we try to justify fun with our money, don't we? Over and over and over again. God wants you to have fun with your money. So this right here, this is, we took a trip to Hawaii two years ago. Guess what? I did it in cash. Do you know why? Come on. I did it in cash. I took my whole family. Do you know why? I saved for it. And I didn't buy things. I saved and I saved and I saved. But my son Judah was months from going to boot camp. And I knew I want to invest the time in my family. So I went to Hawaii and I took my whole family. I didn't apologize to anybody for doing it. Do you know what? I have regretted buying things. I've never regretted having fun with my family. I've never regretted it. We've gone to 30 some states now, driven all over the country. I've had fun with my family. You might say, that is so unspiritual. There's no scriptural support. Boom, right there, okay. (laughs) I I want you to have fun. I don't want you to make an excuse for me when you go on vacation this year. Go on vacation. You can, guess what? You can even miss a Sunday. Go on vacation. Take your family. To every man who God has given wealth and possessions, he has given him the ability to eat from them, to receive the reward, and to find what? Enjoyment. Fun in his toils. These are gifts from the Lord. If I'm not enjoying my money, if I'm not spending time with my family, if I'm not doing those things, I am stressed. Friends, listen, you can make some choices in your life that will change everything for you financially. Yeah, I want to tell you a little story because some of you, this actually might discourage you a little bit. You think, man, you've got lots of money, Pastor. I don't. I actually make less than the income, the normal income around here, okay? But I like having my money in the right place over having things and filling my garage with things that I'll eventually take to goodwill. (laughs) Amen to that one. Let me me tell you, though, when we were um, in our 20s, my wife and I, we were not making it financially. We were not making it. We were miserable. I was up a lot of nights. We were miserable, financially miserable. We were we went to this youth pastor thing and there was a guy there that was teaching about money like I just did. And he said, I can solve anybody's money problems. You bring me, it was just youth pastors. You bring me your budget right now and I will get you out of debt and get you money in the savings and get you a house within three years. We're like, yes. He goes, but I need someone to, to, to let me use you as a case. I was like, yes, me. He said, come on forward. He took all my numbers in front of everybody. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, sorry, we can't help you. And sent me back to a chair. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. We were upset. We drove home. I don't think we talked the whole way home. We thought, we are such losers. We are such losers. I wish you could see me now. <laughs> I wish you could see that picture now. I bet I have a, I bet, I bet I have a bigger house than him now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Listen, do you know what I did? I did the right things over a long period of time. It didn't take me a couple of years. It took me a long period of time. I did the right things over a long period of time and the right results happened. And I want to encourage you today, okay? Because some of you, you feel like I'm so far, my debt, my, listen, you do the right things and God's going to come through for you. Can I hear an amen? amen? Can I hear, come on, okay. Somebody that's had it happen in their life, can I hear a big praise the Lord? Okay, all right. He will come through for you. Now you can stand with me. I told you we're going to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, pray. In everything, pray. In everything, pray, okay? In everything, pray. And then the peace of God will come. Some of you, listen, again, I said it's a very personal thing. Money is a personal thing, so it's hard to respond. But you could be, man, you could be doing great financially, but you need to go another level and you need a miracle to do it. You could be wanting a house really bad and you don't you know how to do it. God can do a miracle for you. You could be, you could be just struggling to get going. Maybe you're young and struggling to get going. God, God can help you. He'll do that for you. He'll do it for you. When you do the right things, He'll do that for you. Will, you. will you close your eyes for a second? I want to pray for you. Now, there's people here today, and they find themselves discouraged and stretched financially. Or they have a dream of somewhere they, they just want to get, but they can't get there because it just seems impossible. I pray you'd encourage their hearts today. Encourage their hearts today. If you need a financial miracle, I want to I pray for you. We're going to pray for you. And, um, 
maybe someone here today, you're doing good financially, but you need God to come through with a house or you need him to come through with, with a new job, promotion at your job. We, we want to we wanna pray for you, okay? Um, Tim and Amy, will you guys come over here and pray? Pray for people. Um, David and Stephanie, you can just turn around right there. I'm going to have you guys pray. And I'm gonna, we're going to do one more song, okay? And if you're here today and you need just God, God to come through, you know our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You know the Bible says that he will provide for you according to his riches and glory. And somebody, maybe you own a business and you need God to just bring a breakthrough in your business. Or you, you have just something on, you just need God in the middle of your finances right now. We want to pray for you. They'll pray for you really quickly. We'll pray God's blessing. We want to bless you as you go and pray over your finances. You just need God to come through. God, I pray that you would do that for people today. In the name of Jesus, let's worship for a few more moments.
want to I want to do some. I didn't do it the other services, but I feel compelled to do it today. It'll just take the service. It'll just take a couple, couple minutes. If you're here today, and you're a business owner, you want a business big or small. I want to pray for you. Okay. Um, selfishly, there's a reason because nobody can invest in the kingdom like you. Nobody can send missionaries like you. Nobody. If your business does well, the kingdom can do well. You can send missionaries. You can make a difference. You can, you can build things. You can build churches. You can, businesses can make a big difference. I want to pray the blessing of God will be upon your business. Is that, is that okay? If you've got a business here today and there's several, I want to invite you. C- come on right up here. I just want to pray for you really quick. I know there's, there's several. There's several that have, have businesses. It's not just a few here. There's, there's quite a few people that you have businesses. And I, I just want to pray. I want to pray God's blessing upon your business. Come on, come on all the way up. Come all the way up here in this little section right right here. Come on. Yeah, there's a lot of, quite, quite a few. Come on, you want God's blessing on your, on your business. Come on. Praise the Lord. Your business can make a difference. And God wants to bless your business. As you're faithful to him, he wants to bless your business so that you can bless the kingdom. You can provide for your family, you can have fun, and you can bless the kingdom of God. So let me pray over you as we prepare to dismiss. God, God, I pray for each one of those represented here today that own businesses, God. God, it can be a very, very stressful thing very stressful, but God, you are in this, Lord. You are in these businesses, God, and I pray, Lord, that they show integrity, and they do the right things over and over and over again, and they put you at the center, not of just their home, but of their businesses, and as they bless employees, and as they prioritize missions, and they prioritize giving, and they keep their eyes on you, God, I pray you would bless their businesses in ways they could have never imagined, Lord, whether it's real estate or construction or whatever it might be, God, I pray you'd bless Bless their business, God. You want to see your people do well. So, God, I pray you touch these business owners. You bless their businesses so they can bless the kingdom, God. We pray that the United States of America would be continue to be known for what it is known for today, which is a generous country that sends missionaries to the world. God, use us. Use us. Prosper these businesses. Prosper them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. Right? A great day. God is good, amen. God is good, and don't rush off. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.